right, that was the undeniably talented ancestor whose music still dwells and and, 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 and lifts us up. That was Luther Vandross. That was Dance With My Father. And in the video, you saw the homegirl, Garcelle Beauvais, right there from my remember, you know, over there, little Haiti, baby. That was Garcelle Beauvais who was in the video, man. And we still got my big brother from another mother, or actually from the same motherland, that is. Yo, Atan, you still there, homie? Of course. You don't make everybody go and run and give their daddy a call after that video. Dad, <laughs> I see that video in a minute. Hey, hey, let me tell you, Atan, man, you know where one of our largest concentration of viewers is? Where's that? Right in the prisons, brother. TGK, oh, right? Miami-Dade County Pri Yeah, they got, I mean, when you say, when, you know, no pun intended, but we have a captive audience in the prisons. No, oh, that's what's up. That's what's yeah. up. Hey, whatever can inspire them, you know what I mean? Yeah, and in fact, I know, I remember you talking, uh, you know, I've heard you tell the story, man, about when you were a young man, all the aggression you had inside you. You right. were a young man, you know, you grew up single moms, and, right. you know, just the anger that was inside of you, man. Talk to them brothers for right quick, man. Oh, no question. I mean, the thing that it was about me, you know, I, when you when you were the man of the house at age seven, you know what I mean? You take on a whole lot of different responsibilities that, that aren't really necessarily responsibilities that you, ha you should have to take on. And, you know, with that comes a resentment, a kind of hardness. Um, and, I, and I understand it. The reason why I have such a passion about always going and speaking to young people in correction facilities is because I, I tell them all the time, I was like, I could have easily been right here with you. It's just by the grace of God that I'm not. I mean, there, there are so many different times and so many different situations and ways that I could have gone. Um, and, and I understand it. And, and one of the things that I always tell them is that how they have to get out, figure out a way to, to, um, to get their frustrations out in a way that won't ruin their lives. And that's why I got into writing. That's when I started. You know, I wasn't really a, a big talker. And everybody always laughs when I say that. But I wasn't a talk, a big talker <laughs> right, when I was right. younger. And, and you know what I mean? And I, I, would, I would always keep things inside. And I really didn't, you know, let my emotions out as far as sharing and stuff like that. But then once I started writing, I mean, no, I could control the pen and the pad, and that's all I really needed. Right. You know what I mean? And so some people need to hit a heavy bag. Some people need to go, you know, lift weights or, you know, on the football field. I ain't never touched the football field. But, right. you know what I mean? Everybody does, you know, what they, what they need to do. Um, and the thing that, that, is, that, that gives guys trouble is when those, those outlets are negative. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of negative things that guys do to take out their frustration. And, and I always encourage young men, especially, the, you know, I do the writing workshop. I have a great group out here in D.C. called uh, Free Mind. And, um, you know, working out, working with new groups all the time. What they started doing was they have, you know, correctional facilities. They don't really have as many of the, of the, uh, the young people's correctional facilities, at least out here in D.C. and uh, P.G. County. But they put them right next to the main prison. You know what I mean? It's so the it's pipeline. like the big prisoners over here, and it's a pipeline. Yeah. And, and I tell them about the pipeline, the school to prison pipeline, and it's all a big setup. And what they want to do is you, you got to figure out a way to be to survive in a system that is set up for you to fail. And that, and when I when I go and I talk to young people, I'm real straightforward with them. I use current events like what happened in Ferguson with Mike Brown. And you know what I mean? And the reason why he was executed and how they demonized the person that was executed. And right now, today, as we're sitting here with this interview, more than a month later, the, the officer, Darren Wilson, who executed him, is, is on paid administrator leave. That's right. He's not even arrested yet. All this stuff has happened, and he still hasn't been arrested. You have four or five uh, uh, witnesses that says, no, his hands were up. So what I tell young people is, listen, you got to understand the game that, that is being played right here. You're not going to get a fair shot. You go in front of the judge, first of all, the judge don't care about your personal problem, your trials and tribulations. You know what I mean? The fact that you ain't getting enough hugs from your daddy or yeah. whatever like that. They don't, don't care nothing about that. The judge might not that. even look at you. The judge might not even look at you in your eyes. He might look right down at your, because at, I've been, I've been working with young people. I've been in the court with them. The judges are so cold, we, we're not going to get affluenza. You know what I mean? And they yeah. get probation or get a little stuff. No, they're going to try to throw the book at us. And I, and I tell them, listen, y'all go down this road, and they are going to try to throw the book at us, and they're going to try to um, market you and, and, and try you as an adult, no matter how if you're 14, 15 years old. That's, that's right. what they're going to try to do. You know what I mean? Because that, that's, it's like prison is like big business for them. So I'm, I'm, I, I tell them the truth, and they hear it, 
when I like last, uh, we're gonna go to Rikers Island again. Um, you know, for during All Star Weekend when, when I'm in New York. Uh, All Star Weekend is in New York this year, so we're gonna go back to Rikers Island. But I went to Rikers Island like a year or two ago, and I went there with Amari Stoudemire, with Styles P, Chris Boussard, right. uh, Malcolm Sabaz. Um, it was amazing, John Wallace, and we went there and talked to these young kids, right? These young cats, all under 18. There's probably like from 17 to about 13. There's about three, four hundred of them. I didn't even know there was that many young cats in Rikers, but it was like wow. three, four hundred of them, right? And yeah. we're telling them, listen, you can, re- you don't have to do this. This isn't living. You get out of here and you do something to change your life. And we're telling them how special they are and how important they are. And listen, they're looking at us like it's something that they had never heard before. Like nobody yeah. had told them that that they deserve better. Yeah. You know what I mean? They deserve better than being in a situation like that, having somebody tell you when to eat, when to sleep, when you can see your family, you know, you know that you don't have any rights. You deserve better than that. And well, it's like the, you, you, when, when you're talking to them, you can see the light bulb go off, but they listen. When, when hearing Amari Stoudemire say it, they listen. That's yeah. why I keep doing these panel discussions all over the country why I'm so passionate about it, because the feedback that I've been getting from these young cats after they hear different athletes, different entertainers, tell them stuff like that, it just resonates. So yes, it's something know, that's really important. Dude, I haven't even thought about it, man. I should have brought in the pictures of the panel that we did down here, whatever, like around this time last year we did one. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. right. We had yeah. to, we were in the church along with my man Nate and Fathers in the Hood and the Fatherhood Task right. Force. Society. We did the panel down here, and it's time for us to do another one, man. And, you know, oh, no question. You know, like you just you talked about as a youth and you and you made the relationship with yourself. Now, fast forward a little bit more with everything that you went through, man. We just had a right. picture on the screen of you and your wife. And mm-hmm. um, now you're a bona fide seven foot man. And your wife <laughs> is like pretty close to you, brother. Like, <laughs> I'm like, yo, I, I, yo, I, well, I tell, I tell my children, I tell people to joke sometimes, man. When we were hanging out, and I had my children go take a picture with you, and my uh, son leans over to me, he says, "Daddy, do you still want me to go take the picture with the giant?" <laughs> Ah, <laughs> so, uh, that's funny. Now I'm looking, <laughs> now I'm looking at you and your wife, man, and your beautiful family, man. Talk a little bit about uh, the transition that you had to go through and about you talked about Malcolm who's there in the middle. Talk about what it's like now, yeah. you being a young man who didn't have a father in his life, trying to keep your family together and how how that ties into your work with fatherhood. Oh, no question. I mean, basically what I tell people, you know, is that with that, I, you know, I didn't grow up with, with my father. I, I saw him once a month, maybe, you know what I mean, visitations, if it worked out right. You know, I, we just didn't yeah. really have a close relationship like that. That's just the way, that was just the reality of it. So, of course, growing up, I had anger. There was different, you know, people who weren't in that situation can't really understand how it feels. You know, to go to a basketball game and other cats have their fathers and your father's not there. You know what I mean? Or something like that happening. There's a father and son thing at school, and you know you can't, you know, really participate because your father's not with you. So, so stuff like that always kind of brings anger about. But what I was trying to do with my kids is something that I didn't really have. I didn't have the day-to-day, every day, come home, you know what I mean? How you doing? You know, how was your day at school? Tell me what's wrong, what you got a problem with. Oh, for real, that happened with the teacher. Well, this is the way you're supposed to handle it. Okay, I'm going to help you with your homework. Okay, I'm going to discipline you when you get out of line. All of that stuff I miss. You know what I mean? And so I try to pour that into my kids as much as I can. You know what I mean? All the hugs and all the stuff like that that I didn't get growing up, I try to do that ten times as much, you know, with, with, with my kids. And, and it's like it's something that you, you would never want your kids to feel what you felt. Do you know what I mean? And I always tell people, like I ask them, like I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to a group of young kids, and, you know, a lot of times cats are in the same situation. You know, I don't, I'm like, I don't even have to ask you how many of y'all growing up with your fathers right now. Like, don't even raise your hand and stuff like that, but just picture this. Picture your son or daughter feeling about you the same way that you feel about your father. You know what I mean? And nobody would want that. Nobody would ever even imagine. Like, it it would hurt me to even imagine my son going through anything like that. You know what I mean? So you want to do everything that you possibly can. So, look, look, going going back to my book, the way that I heard, like, Grant Hill talk about his father, I had never even heard nobody talk about their father like that. (laughs) Wow. That is so not funny, but I see what you mean, man. 
Oh, it was beautiful to see. Like, I, and, and like, you know, so I didn't write this book thinking that I'm no expert in it. Actually, the first line of the book of the book is, "I am not a fatherhood expert." Do you know what I mean? Because I don't want anybody to think that that's what I'm going around thinking that I'm an expert and got all the answers. But I'm I'm learning and listening and hearing all the different stories and being inspired by the different panels and things like that right along with everybody else. Because it's an actual, it's a journey, and and it and it and it, and it, and it, it transcends. You know, color lines and racial lines and economic lines because the same thing that, you know, Howard Dean is in the book and Tony Hawk is in the book. The same things that they talk about are the same things that Ice Cube and, and Styles P talk about. Yeah, and, and Yao Ming. You know what I mean? Yeah, and Yao, and right, on the other side of the of, planet. Right. It's a matter of wanting to do the best for your kids and having different hurdles that take you away from not being able to. And looking back on your life when you was uh, younger and the things that you missed out from your father. And you know what I mean? Some situations are worse than others. And, and you know, you get a chance to value the time that you did have. You know what I mean? And, and it's just a matter of just, uh, like, looking inward and being able to grow from it. Because everybody, everybody has room for growth. Ain't nobody doing it perfectly. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's, that's just the, the reality. That's of the, the reality situation. of Ain't nobody it, doing it perfectly. For sure. Right. Everybody's got room for growth. And I know that in sitting down and going through the book, you know, uh, one of the things I often share with fathers when we talk about doing a support group or, you know, coming to a class or something, the thing is, you you know, you get that look that's like, ah, oh, you know, I don't really need that. But one of the right. things, you know, man, I don't, I don't think that there is one of us who have been born with a child with an instruction manual around their neck of what they need, how they need to grow, what's going to happen when they're 13. So, man, thank you so much for the book. That just oh, you no know, helps to expand the concept of fatherhood in the work that you're doing, man. And you know, before we go, we can't we can't just re we can't break out with talk without talking. Up, you're in Chocolate City, D.C., and right. um, you know what's happening with the Atlanta Hawks and what they call the New South, or they don't call it Chocolate City, but you know, Black Lana, and you can have a uh, a owner of a team. You know, I know right. it's a, I know it's a business, but the reality is, and, and unknown to most people, is that the Atlanta Braves are moving from out of downtown and going into Cobb mm -hmm. County, pro probably for the same reason that this guy wrote the letter. You know, so anyhow, my point in it, that's just laying the foundation for the question a ton, and you know, being in the in, a former NBA guy and 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 being mm -hmm. very strong and black conscious about what's happening in the world and in, in our community in our country what do you what is your take on you know the uh, the levinson atlanta hawks and the email because personally you said something really key on msnbc you said man he fell down on the sword too quick man and i i, right. saw, the, dude, I, saw, I saw the same thing man when i heard i was like he was like man i wrote the email one billion please <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 exactly. And and that's kind of what I thought. You know, I'm looking I'm looking at everything, I'm like, wait a minute, something looks a little bit fishy here with For this real? entire thing. I'm like, so so really? So you just gonna come out with it, you're not gonna try to say no, I didn't really mean it like that. Like, <laughs> no, that's not really how I feel, what I was trying to say. You're not gonna say none of that, you just gonna fall on the floor and say, Yes, I'm terrible, take the team away from me. Yeah. I'm like, so wait a minute now I, and what I suspected was that he saw the what happened with Donald Sterling. And, and, and he saw exactly what the team sold for. Because remember, the Clippers sold for $2 million. That was and he crazy. Bought, he, and he bought the Clippers for a fraction of the cost. Yeah, fraction. A fraction of that. Yeah, like Right, right, right. So, dude, so, so ridiculously. Punished, he wasn't really punished. That's not really a punishment, being able to sell it for $2 billion cash in. So I suspect that he just saw that and wanted to seize the opportunity to really cash out. That, yeah. That's what I suspect happened with, with, with him. And, and it's really interesting, another conversation, is that a lot of people were saying that it really wasn't racism, it was really just business. It like, was. I kept hearing that over and over again, and I'm thinking about it, I'm like, well, wait a minute now. You've got to understand the, the language that he used. Because we, it wasn't a long long ago where the real estate agents, where we were trying to go and integrate different neighborhoods, they were using those same excuses of saying, "Well, listen, it's not, we're not it's not racism. You know what I mean? It's just business. It's just that it's not that we don't like you. It's just that you know your black face is going to lower our property values, so we That's can't right. have you move into this neighborhood." And you got to understand that is the exact same thing that Donald Sterling and Shelley Sterling were doing in their apartment complex in the early two thousands. 
You yeah. know what I mean? When they didn't want black people and brown people to move into their apartment complex because they said, and that's just an excuse for racism. You can't hide under the umbrella of racism like you could back in olden days. Yeah. You know what I mean? So Danny Ferry, Danny Ferry going to say something racist in, in a board meeting, you know what I mean, with everybody and, and, and try to weasel out of it and say, okay, well, actually, you know, I was just kind of repeating something that somebody else said. That's not really how I felt, but I was just going to bring it to everybody. And I'm like, no, if you repeated it, it brought it to everybody like that, then you were saying it, Danny Barry. Don't don't just sit here and lie to us. Right, but you right. can't you can't get away with racism the way that you could in the past. You know what I mean? People don't have to bite their lip and, and hearing your racist jokes and just take it. You know what I mean? Now yeah. they can report you. Now they can videotape you. Now that now they can okay say, All right, you're gonna do this racist joke again, I'm gonna put this I'm gonna press record right here and I'm yeah. gonna send this to the powers that be. You know That's what I mean? Right. They don't have to take that no more. So you can't hide behind this umbrella of it's just business. And that was, that's, a, that's a coward way of being able to weasel out from it. Just, just stand up and say that you said something that was racist and you don't like You know what I mean? Don't try to weasel out of it. And that's why I mean, it, it, we'll see what happens with Danny Ferry. We'll see how they handle But I agree with Maddie Johnson. Maddie Johnson sent a tweet out that said that the, Atlanta, the, the fans of Atlanta deserve much better than the leadership of the Atlanta Hawks. That's what he said, and I agree 100%. I agree, and and I think that what the guy was saying was about business, and you put it into the right context with the other guys who are about business, but you just can't say it's about business, and then you in a city that's predominantly black, but you don't want your audience to be predominantly black. So I get it, man. Listen, Natan, right. thank you so much, brother. Your book, Fatherhood, no Rising problem. to the Ultimate Challenge, forward by Tony Dungy. Listen, man, where can people find you at? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at AtonThomas36. Uh, i got my website, AtonThomas.com. I'll be around doing different panels and speaking at different places. Uh, I'll be on the Melissa Harris Perry show this Sunday talking about Ray Rice and the whole situation. Where, so, what, what, is that on? what is What is that on? Uh, Melissa Harris Perry is on, is on MSNBC. It's on uh, at 11 a.m. Oh, oh, yeah, okay, Eastern right, time. right. Got gotcha, you, yeah, got gotcha, you, yeah, got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you're going to yeah, be yeah. on there. We got Aton, at Aton Thomas 36 You got AtonThomas.com. You could Google the brother, Aton Thomas, the book Fatherhood. I know you're a spoken word artist as well. You Man, yo, right. so much. Yo, God bless you, man, and your family. And thanks for hanging out with us, homie. Ah, uh, No problem. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. I'll give you a shot later on, man, so we can see how we're going to bring you back down here, man. Do something real big for the fathers in the community hey. over here. Hey. hey, let's do it. I'm ready when you are. Let's hook it up. All right, my brother. God bless you, man, and we'll talk soon, all right? All right. Bless up. All right. Peace. Yo, man, that was my man. Aton Thomas, let's go right off into this next video. I think that one of the best videos we could show right now is Soul Sister number one. That's Sister Angie Stone and this super duper track. This is Brother. We'll be right back. And everything I am is my support system. I can't live without him. The best thing since sliced bread is his 